Hello and welcome to the vlog. It's a bit of a short one this time round, but it did take quite a lot of filming and quite a lot of editing, so I hope you will forgive me the short duration. This is the first in a short series of videos I'm doing all about classic narrowboat engines and what the appeal is, because while many people like myself have modern engines, there are some people who specifically set out to have a vintage or classic or rare or unusual engine in their narrowboat and I wanted to know well what's the appeal and is it more difficult more awkward to have an older classic engine as I say this is a short series I've filmed three so far and in case you're wondering no one of those is not a Bollinger I will do one with a Bollinger at some point but I, I didn't find anyone with one when I first put out the appeal for engines but they should all be very interesting I hope so I'll shut up and let's get on with having a look at it. On a pontoon at a marina somewhere in the East Midlands, there is a 70 foot long, extremely shiny tug style narrowboat. Peer in through the side hatches and a little gem meets your eye. It's a Russell Newbury DM2. It's a marinized uh, four stroke, two cylinder, 2.6 litre vintage diesel. So you've got a six and a half inch stroke and a four and one eighth inch of bore. Uh, ticks over at about 150, 200 RPM, flat out at about 950, and produces a whole 18 horsepower. However, mountains of torque. The engine itself was designed in 1928. This particular one, um, I'm led to believe, is the last one out of the factory. Uh, it's only five years old. And it's got about two, two and a half thousand running hours on it. When I bought the boat, I had a very strict criteria of what I wanted. I very much wanted a traditional uh, looking boat. I wanted a traditional boatman's cabin at the back and an engine in an engine room. It was a case of had to find all those things. I spent months searching for the right boat, the right engine, the right toilet of all things. And everything came together just before Christmas, two years ago when I found this particular boat. Went to see it, fell in love with it in about 30 seconds flat and straight away went out and bought it. A classic engine can be a pain, especially when they're cold. There's no, no glow plugs, no preheater, no nothing. It's all done on compression. So you've got two ways of doing it. You've got decompressors, which lose all the compression out of the engine. So it spins over really easy, get the engine wound up, throw the decompressors over to bring the compression back into the engine and it will fire. Or there is an excess fuel flap on it, a bit like a choke on an old car lift the flap, it puts a completely huge shot of diesel straight into the cylinders and it starts off with a whacking great bang, big cloud of smoke, and away it goes. The only problem is, of course, that you have monograde oil which is like treacle when it's cold so you'll watch the oil pressure almost try and bend the needle off the, off the gauge it ticks over like a sewing machine once it starts warming up and all the oil's got around um, i run it on a high tick over to begin with when it's stone cold as it is at the moment uh, but once it's warm it'll quite happily just sit there and as you say kaplunk 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 and it will just sit there and tick like that all day it's like a watch As for maintenance, it's the same as anything else really. An oil filter is an oil filter, a fuel filter is a fuel filter. The only weird and wonderful thing is that the valves on this particular engine, um, they're pushrod operated, so the pushrods do this, but the valves actually do this. So it's quite a tricky little job to uh, get them adjusted, but it's, it's, it's all bog basic engineering, apart from the fact that it's all Whitworth bolts. I'm very much of old school. I like steam engines, old vintage diesels, and anything that makes a noise, explodes, or basically just makes a mess, which is great because this thing does all of them. I hate the sound of modern buzzy engines. You sort of hit, see them going past you on the cut, and all you hear is zzzz, whereas this, it's dump, 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 dump. You know, if it was going down the street, it would fire every other lamppost. It's great. It's like a heartbeat. To keep the temperature down in the engine room, you run with the engine room doors wide open, and it stops too much heat building up in there and you can guarantee that boats will go past and everybody will go, oh, look at that, fantastic, you know, love your engine. The one thing I would say about this engine 
and any engine with this much brass on it, go into it with both eyes open because trust me, you will spend the rest of your life eating through brasso, polishing cloths and time because that's all you ever do. Seriously, if you're thinking of buying a classic boat with a classic engine, you have got to be either X-Forces and know how to polish brass like you wouldn't believe, or you've got severe OCD. Um, that engine takes about two weeks to polish up properly. Uh, if you want to go bananas and do it all in one day, you're looking at about eight hours to polish it. Um, normally, they don't come with quite as much brass and copper, but the previous owner who had the boat built uh, basically took one look at the options book from Russell Newbury and said, yep, all of it, and that was it. I've got the works. Now, I find it quite therapeutic, actually, but also I'm X-Forces, so, you know, I have to get my fix of polishing things up from somewhere. Also, they leak oil for a pastime. You will spend your life clearing up, swearing, cursing, chasing oil leaks, and you'll never get to the end of them. These have a habit of sticking their valves open, which uh, is a bit inconvenient, to say the least. But if you're thinking, do your research, not all en vintage engines are easy to get parts for. Certainly Thornycrofts are virtually impossible. Listers, they grow on parts grow on bushes at the bottom of the garden. The factory for this engine is actually still open and based at Hill, Hill Morton. So literally 10 minutes in the car and you're there. Um, oil is oil at the end of the day. Um, however, it uses monograde oil, unlike modern engines. Oil filters are oil filters. You can get them pretty much any channel is going. Um, there are some specialist components that you do need to get either from the manufacturer or specialist engineers. Same with gardeners, there's several specialists who build the, you know, they, they spend time building these engines up and repairing them and restoring them. You do get specialist engineers who know their, know their onions and they'll come and work it all out for you, but they, you do have to pay for them to travel. Uh, the engineer who I get to come and look at this one has to travel from Shropshire. So I get charged three hours of travelling time before he actually lifts a spanner. Join an owner's club. They're all, they're all out there. Uh, there's the Russell Newby Register. Uh, they have big get-togethers. If you've got a gardener, there's the gardener club. Um, and they don't do sprouts and things like that. You know, we're talking big lumps of aluminium and steel. But they, they both clubs have rallies every year. And there's quite a sort of fun rivalry. You know, oh, you've got a... A rusty new bolt no it's a russell newbury and you've got a gardener whatever you know there's a bit of fun and games going on but it's good <laughs>